Welcome to our fifth presentation of our South Fayette Township School District Speaker Series. This school year we set out to provide a variety of topics uh, and speakers that we felt were relevant and helpful for our families. And tonight's presentation was coordinated by our athletic director, Mark Keener, and is focused on raising the hardworking student athletes within our schools. We are very fortunate to have a special guest speaker with us tonight. He is an NFL veteran, a former University of Pittsburgh football All-American tight end, and co-host of the 93.7 The Fan Morning Show. And if you missed the show this morning, there was a heated debate, um, not the Brian Reynolds contract extension, but whether soft pretzels or hard snack pretzels uh, are better. So, love that, very entertaining. Um, but as a former athlete and father of athletes and athletic analyst, he is with us tonight to cover all sides of the athletic journey. So, please welcome Mr. Doran Dickerson. Thank you very much. How's everybody doing? We got a packed house tonight, huh? This is nice. This is perfect. Now, uh, thank you for having me, uh, this South Fayette School District. And uh, my name is Doran Dickerson. I grew up in uh, West Allegheny, right over the hill. Played for Bob Palco in high school. Um, played there, obviously, four years. Then went to the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, played a bunch of positions, moved around and finally settled at tight end, uh, was an All-American, got drafted in the seventh round to the Houston Texans, uh, played six years in the NFL. I was a WWE recruit, so I tried out for WWE for a while, and then I found myself getting into the media side of things and uh, found myself on the radio every single morning here in Pittsburgh and covering the Pitt football team uh, every single game on the sidelines. And, you know, I kind of wanted to make this an open discussion, you know, after I kind of lay the foundation of this, uh, of this talk right now. And, you know, growing up, as a young athlete, uh, I always looked for resources. And fortunately, I always had resources. My uncle, Ron Dickerson, was one of the first African-American head coaches in college football. Uh, he coached at Pitt, he coached at Penn State, and then he finally uh, was a head coach at Temple. And he was always around. My dad was a, a football coach for 30 years at Cornell High School. Um, my uncle, my other uncle, here, let, let's reverse. My cousin, who was Ron Dickerson's son, Ron Dickerson Jr., he played for State College. He was uh, a track All-American at Arkansas and also played football and played in the NFL for six years. My cousin played for Louisville, started for four years. His son, who is six months apart from me, played for Northwestern, was Mr. Ohio, played in the NFL for three years. His brother, uh, Dylan Maben, plays for the Atlanta Falcons right now. His, so my other cousin, who's the brother of the Louisville cousin, played at Nebraska, won two national championships. His son plays for the Tennessee Titans right now. So my family is full of football and full of knowing how to uh, approach every single day and to create that foundation, and especially the parents and you know my uncles and my cousins and then our generation, they showed us the way. And it's not just about football, it's about life. It's about the little things, it's about treating people the right way, it's about, it's about taking care of yourself, taking care of your family and taking care of people outside of your family, your school, um, representing the name on the front of the jersey and also representing the name on the back of the jersey because on the back of the jersey at the end of the day that is what you're representing that is your family that is the pipeline of you being who you are and you know we can talk about athletics but life is really the most important thing that you can learn and football and basketball and baseball and whatever sport you play, however you approach life will trickle into that. That will trickle in and how you approach every single day and becoming a successful young athlete. Um, and, and the most important thing that I learned growing up and playing sports as a young person, and my dad taught me this, was have fun. You know, at the young age, it's supposed to be fun. I don't know one 10-year-old that has made it to the NFL at 10, year, 10 years old. I don't know one 11-year-old that made it to the MLB at 11 years old. I don't know one 17-year-old that made it to the NFL. So the point is, whenever you're trying to raise your kid and trying to really divvy up school, life, athletics, 
It's about having fun. It's about being a good person. It's about having morals. Because that, it, it, it's, it doesn't shut off. And if you want to be successful, you have to do those little things because that's the only way you can get to the top. It is a full-time job of being a successful or just being an athlete or being a, 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 a top-tier student. You have to have it on every single day. And that was so important that my parents showed me that when I was younger. Um, you know, I, I could be out there running laps every single day, but it was also important for me to go play with my friends outside. It was important for me to play uh, video games with my friends because it's not that serious at a young age age. And as you grow, you figure out what you want to do and what your kids may want to do and where they're leaning towards. Um, and then you could take it from there. But it is very, very vital to have the mindset of it is a full-time gig of being a good person. If you're a good person, things will happen. If you do things the right way, sports will fall in line. And if you are a team player, the individual accolades will come. And Bob Pelko showed me that when Rao was a young teenager, is that if we win, you will be successful as a young player. And we did win. And then the offers came in, and the scholarships came in, and the yards, they started piling up. Those little things that you take care of are so important, and you have to be a part of the team. You have to be engraved in winning and trying to win. Nobody is perfect, but you can strive to be perfect. You can strive to be a perfect parent. I don't care if you're eight years old. I don't care if you're 60 years old. You can still strive every day to find your talent, to try to be a better dad, a better mother, a better partner, a better sister, a better brother. And you know, to really wrap that all into one, you know, clump right now is that that all trickles into your day to day, whether you're an athlete or not. So I, I always found that that was important. And that's one life lesson that I learned from my parents is that it's not that serious at that age. Yes, you want to learn the little details of how you play a sport, but the other things are really what matters. That's what really matters whenever you are doing the right things and doing the things necessary. So um, whether you have kids, and I have three little boys at home, and I, I, you know, I look at them, and my, my oldest, he has my mentality. Like, you know, he misses a shot, then he has to shoot 100 shots. And, you know, if he does 10 push-ups, no, I want to do 20. I'm like, you know what, just do 10 and then go play with your brother because this is not what life is about right now. Obviously, I don't tell him that, but I kind of show him that it's important to be a kid. It's important to have fun because you don't, and, you, and parents know, uh, you guys know how fast it goes. It goes so fast. I remember yesterday I was playing football at West Allegheny and now I have three kids and I'm doing speeches and stuff. So like it's, it's very important and vital to be in your kid's life, but athletics is almost secondary. If you teach them how to be a good person, teach them how to do things the right way, athletics will come. And, you know, obviously the working hard cliches and that, we don't have to get into that because that is almost a given whenever you want to be a successful athlete. So, you know, that was really what I wanted to open with today. And I kind of wanted to, you know, go around the room and just kind of make this a back and forth. If you guys have any any question. I mean, I do these speeches a lot, and I do it to a lot of middle schools, to a lot of high schools, and obviously the question is, I played for the New England Patriots, I played with Tom Brady, and they, people want to know what that's like. I know I, I get that all the time. So, uh, but what's Bill Belichick like? Well, he's kind of dry, and he's kind of funny, actually, but um, if you guys have any questions, I think that we may have a microphone that's going to be passed we around. Do. So, feel free. I mean, there's nothing that is off the board right now. If you want to ask, I'm here, and I will ask, I will answer any question you need to. Thank you. So obviously growing up uh, with a family that was so involved in athletics, um, sports were probably pretty important in your household. <clears throat> and your parents were obviously very involved in your sports. How did they handle, and, and, and how do you suggest handling the critical part of uh, parenting a child in athletics? You know, it's really easy when your child's doing well and, you know, you can give them all kinds of accolades, but one of the challenges that we have is, is being critical with our child when it comes to athletics. Uh, 
it's about explaining um, instead of yelling or instead of tearing down. You always want to build up, and that's what my parents did with me. They always built me up, but they explained when I did something wrong. Um, you know, sit down and have a talk. You don't need to, um, you know, if, if they have a bad game, you don't need to call them out in front of their, their teammates. You don't need to call them out in front of people. You sit down and talk to them, and kids will respond to that. They will respond to, um, you know, their heroes, which is you. I mean, at the end of the day, your parents at a young age are your heroes. And if you talk to them in a normal manner and you give them constructive criticism, they will respond. And it doesn't have to be yelling. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, a, a tearing down. If you build up while you're constructively criticizing, kids will respond. And, you know, they're like sponges. They see everything. They see how you operate. They see, you know, how you approach your day to day. So, um, you know, if you're going through a situation like that where, you know, you do have to you do have to figure out a way to get through to your kid if something did go wrong in athletics, just sit them down and talk to them. Be like, well, what did you think that you did wrong? Or what did you think in this situation? And, you know, you can process that, and then you could take your approach with how you want to handle it. You know your kid's the best more than anybody. So you, you know, I've had so many coaches who coached everybody the same. And that's, to me, not the way you coach. Everybody's different. You know, some guys, you know, can take the, the, the mental heat whenever things get tough. Some guys can't. They don't respond to that. Some, you know, you know, women basketball player or softball player, they, uh, you know, need to be talked to a certain way in order to get the most out of them. So you know your kids the best and how they will respond to constructive criticism. And, you know, that is the absolute approach is you know your kid, sit down with them, talk to them, and then – Process that, figure out which direction do you need to go from there. Okay, thank you. Uh, one other question. How was it playing with Tom Brady? <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly like you think. It's like playing, it's like playing with Michael Jordan. Yeah, I remember my first day and, and, and just him walking through the hall and quick story. I went up to him. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not shy at all. Like I go up to anybody, I talk to anybody, and I'm like, hi, hi Tom, I'm Doran Dickerson. I just signed here. This is uh, – in the middle of the season. He's like, yeah, I know you're tight end at Pitt. And I was like, I have a question for you. How come you're still the first person in the building every day and the last person to leave? You've already won four Super Bowls. This is in 2011. Tom was 34 years old, my age now at the time. And I was like, you already won four Super Bowls. How come you're still the first person in the building and the last person to leave every day? And he looked at me, he said, Doran, he said, they drafted me in the sixth round. And he walked away. And he still has that chip on his shoulder. And I'll never forget that. I'm like, this guy has done it all already. And that still bothers him. And that still drives him. So even, you know, with your kids, you can, you can tap into stuff like that. You can figure out and kind of play that mental chess game of, you know, how can I get the most out of my kid? Because everybody has a tick. Everybody has a, a, something inside them that wants to come out in a positive way to do some positive things. So that was Tom's tick. And I'll never forget that moment just being like, Wow, like I'll, I'll never, I'll never uh, understand how somebody can just win, 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 and then still keep wanting to win. Like it's, it's amazing. My question was, can you speak to uh, the balance of time management? especially when students are so heavily involved in academics, the rigor, especially of our school district. So what advice could you give about that balance and what did you learn uh, in regards to time management being a student athlete? Well, it's, uh, school comes first. I mean, you can't play football, you can't play athletics unless you take care of your school and you take care of you know, your classes and you have good grades. So um, the structure's in place and I'm obviously a big structure person, and I had that a lot in my life. Um, the school structure, the day-to-day, -day, you know, whenever you go to this class or that, that class, whenever you go to lunch, you kind of, you know, ca encapsulate that and take it to the athletic side. It's like, all right, I have to be meetings here. I have to, you know, get dressed at this time. Like, that's kind of how I operate. I was like, at this time, at, at 4.35, I know that I have to tie up my cleats like that's kind of down to the minute how I always operate as an athlete and that has a lot to do with all right well I have to I have a test at 11 a.m. or 11.02 a.m. I have to make sure that my mind is right for that and then whenever that's done it's like all right what's the next step what's the next step what's the next step and you kind of compartmentalize every single thing and that all rolls into one really what I was saying uh, in the beginning like those things right there can help you as an athlete because that does give you the structure 
especially as a young athlete, to really do the things necessary in the right manner whenever you are approaching your day-to-day -day of uh, athletics. Thank you. Hello. Um, I have an athlete that is recovering from an injury, so I was wondering if you had any suggestions for how we support her and what that looks like because she's gone backwards in some skills. Uh, yeah, mental. You know, just keep their spirits up high and, and uh, you know, never lose hope and make sure that there's still hope out there. I've seen the craziest of crazy situations. I've seen people come back from three ACLs. You know, I tore my Achilles. I tore my hip flexor, came back from that. Um, it is possible. You know, just make them think that they can. Make, you know, your daughter think that she can come back. And honestly, to be, you know, and then obviously, like I said, open discussion, you know, with medicine and, and rehabilitation nowadays, you can come back 100%. Like, I mean, 10 years ago, 12 years ago when I was playing, I told my Achilles and they're like, ah, you know, I don't know if you're going to be the same. Uh, now, if you tear your Achilles or tear your ACL, it's like, all right, you're back. You're running in three months. So it is possible. And she has to think that way, that like, I will do everything necessary. And then you have to be that kind of vessel towards her. Like, you can do this. You can get through this. This is just an obstacle. And she's going to face obstacles her whole entire life, as you do, as I do, as everybody else does. There's always going to be adversity. And that's the true test of a person. That's the true test of an athlete is how you figure out that adversity and get through that and get on the other side. You learn a lot about yourself whenever you lose. You learn a lot about yourself whenever you face adversity. And I think it's very necessary for life to ha have to have adversity because you figure out who you really are and you test yourself. And if she has that mental mindset created and kind of filtered through you, she'd be like, I can do it. I can get through it. Yeah, I'm going to take this day by day. I'm going to work at this. I'm going to get myself back to where I once was. And it's amazing what you can do to the brain and almost trick the brain in any situation, um, especially whenever times are tough. So she'll be fine. And, you know, like I said, I mean, rehab now, she'll be back before no time. Thanks. Hello. When did you decide that you want to be an athlete and uh, you will play only football in your in your future career? When did I decide I wanted to be an athlete? Um, at a very young age, you know, when, in the beginning when I was talking about my uncle, my dad would take me to Temple games and I'd be on the sidelines with one of my cousins who played at Northwestern. Uh, we were six years old and we would see uh, Temple play Pitt. We would see Temple play Penn State. We would see Temple play Miami. And I, I'll never forget. I was just thinking about this the other day. I'll never forget looking at my cousin being like, well, we're going to be here one day. Like it was it was almost a must. It was like a manifest way of, of, of approaching that. And it was about six years old whenever it was just always around me. And it was kind of an expectancy to, to be there. But not everybody has that situation. And, you know, you have to love what you're doing. And as a kid, if you don't have that resource and you're looking for avenues of why you're doing something, um, you have to love it. And you can tell if your kid loves it. If they don't love it, then it's time to probably move on to something else because then you're just getting redundant and you're, you know, you're, you're, you're getting uh, dried out and you don't want that to happen. So it's really finding that love for what you're doing, not just sports, it could be playing the piano, it could be uh, you know, playing the saxophone, it could be anything. If you love what you do and you could tap into that, then that's whenever you figure out that's what you should be doing. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Can I ask? Hello. Yeah. Um, you had a great um, NFL career, but did you have any b uh, backup plans when you were playing? That's a, that's a great question. And I, I got released my rookie year, and I ended up playing six years after that. But I went back to the University of Pittsburgh, and I talked to the people that you know, were really uh, important to me there and figuring out what I wanted to do. And I always knew I needed a plan B because NFL stands for not for long. Um, you know, that's a saying in the NFL because it isn't for long and um, you have to have that plan B. And I always felt that I, I wanted to get in the media, I wanted to do something, but I honestly never knew what I was 
going to do? Because I played football since I was six years old. That's all I knew. And that is a very tough situation as we talk about adversity. Like, what, what else am I good at? Because I've only done one thing in my life. And then, you know, you rely on your resources. You rely on, rely on the people uh, that have taught you things and, and really guided you through uh, your football life or your athletic life. And, you know, I found myself like I'm thinking, like what what qualities do I have that can be an asset to society? And I'm like, hmm. I remember when I was 15 years old, I did my first interview after a football game, and Kevin Gorman is his name. He was a reporter. He's like, Gorman, you speak very well. Maybe you'll have a career in reporting, or maybe you'll have a career in TV whenever you're done playing football. And I was 15 years old, and that always stuck with me. And you know, here we are. You know, I, I'm talking for a living on the radio, and you know, he was somewhat right and I always was like what am I good at oh I can talk pretty well so let me try that and I kind of found it thank you it's always good to have plan B oh and C and D and yeah. Yeah, everything you always got to be prepared thank you. have you ever played for the Steelers no I did not I was there one day and then I got hurt I tore my thumb and then that was it but I was always a fan of the Steelers growing up. Loved the Steelers. Always had the jerseys playing in the backyard, pretending I was Jerome Bettis, pretending I was Cordell Stewart. He has no clue who these people are. Um, T.J. Watt. Do you know T.J. Watt? Yeah. Kenny Pickett. You know, I was pretending I was those guys. But I never had, really had the chance to actually go out there on Heinz Field and play in an NFL game. Now, I played at Heinz Field, Akershore Stadium now in college, but never got the chance to put on a Steeler jersey. Did Tom Brady ever throw to you? Yes. <laughs> yes, he did. He did. I dropped it. Yeah, yeah, that was it. That's a, that, was, that was it for me. <laughs> One question I had, of, uh, parents have a lot, and students have a lot of options when it comes to athletics, especially youth programs. There's in-house in with the community, there's travel teams, there's the school athletic program, there's those pay-to-play programs type of situations. There's also the private training approach. I think parents are are always kind of asking, what is the, the best route? What's going to get my, my child on that fast track or on that track to success in, in athletics? What advice do you give? What do you think really is that perfect path? Play everything. Try everything. You can learn, and then and then you'll figure out what you're the best at. Um, if you play baseball, if you play basketball, if you run track, if you play softball, and you play basketball, uh, you can learn so many different qualities from other sports that you could take and bring into your sport that you actually settle on at the end of the day. I grew up as a wrestler, and I swear to this day that may be into a tight end because of my leverage, because of mental toughness, things of that nature. So try everything. You know, you're not going to stick with everything, but it's nice to figure out how other sports work, and then you can incorporate that into your actual sport. And also just being around a team and learning how to be a team player and keeping that process going of relying and on somebody else or somebody else relying on you and knowing that you know it doesn't matter what the guy or or woman looks like next to you they could be black they could be you know asian it doesn't matter whenever you play sports that's a beautiful part about sports that does not matter you know in the society we live in today i don't want to get into all that but whenever the lights come on and your teammates next to you there's only one objective, and that's to win. And you learn those things through sports. You learn those things through not just one sport, but multiple sports. And it's important, I believe. I mean, everybody has their own theory of sticking with one sport and training uh, for that sport, you know, your whole entire life. But there's so many great qualities you can learn from, you know, different organizations or different sports or different communities doing different things. You know, just be an open mind and not shut it off and not block anything out ask a lot of questions too. Hi, I just had a question. Um, it seems in youth sports, there is a lot of pressure put on student athletes from a young age and the um, mental health aspect has been given a lot more attention in the last few years, it seems, and especially it's hit home here at South Fayette last year. We had a former student athlete um, die by suicide. And with social media and all those things, um, what do you have any advice for parents, like how to sort of navigate those 
pressure situations where your kids might not be feeling like I don't know. Like, yeah. do, you, do you understand what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, no, yeah, Sorry. absolutely. I know, absolutely. This is a great, this is a great question. And, you know, I didn't really have to deal with this. Right. Thank goodness. And I, I see it now. And I can't imagine, my oldest is eight years old. And I can't imagine what it's going to be like in six, seven years, whenever, you know, they're in high school. Um, but monitor, you know, you're the parent. Monitor whether they have Instagram, whether they have Twitter, whether they have TikTok. You get the password. You know what they're doing. You know what they're posting. You know what other people are posting. And not just monitor their activity on the social medias, but monitor them and be like, how are you doing today? You know, that could just go a long way. Just like, are you, are you feeling great? How's your spirit? You know, just talk to them and, and make sure that they're good up here. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of kids will come in and I had a good workout. I'm feeling this, but, you know, something may be not right upstairs. And you don't know that because athletes are prideful. And whenever you grow into an athlete, you get even more prideful. So as a parent, you are the, you are the vice, you are the, the, the leader, and you have the ability to monitor any situation of your kid, and especially monitor them mentally. So, you know, every once in a while, I'll just be like, oh, how, how's your day going? Or, you know, how'd you do today? How was school today? I mean, I'm sure that you do that, but that goes a long way, more than I think parents realize, is just checking in on how your kids are doing. And, you know, if they're down, and then talk to them, and, 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 and figure it out from there, but it's very important to to really understand your kid and really to ask how they're just doing. I mean, I know that's a broad answer, but sometimes the little answers are the big answers, and that's what um, I think is necessary, especially nowadays. I mean, that is a great question, and I think about that a lot because, like, you know, I was right on the tail end of what social media is now. I didn't really have it, uh, but I can't imagine having to deal with that nowadays and seeing comments and. Oh, it just it, it is terrible. It really is at, at times, and it does help at times too. So, um, yeah, just ask how they're doing, and, and really just monitor them in their day to day. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Looking back at your career, what what's your proudest moment? I would say is the first part of the question. And then now knowing what you know, going back, what would you maybe do differently in your athletic career? I wrote a letter to my 17 year old self last year and said, thank you. Um, you, know, you know, I didn't have social media, but I dealt with a lot and a lot of, um, a lot of things thrown at me, you know, with 50 scholarships at 17 years old, um, you know, coaches flying in from California, coaches flying in from Texas saying, hey, we love you, we want you to come to this school, this, this, and that, and having to make a big decision of where I'm going to spend my next four to five years, um, and I chose the University of Pittsburgh, and it's right down the street, you know, really from where I grew up, 25 minutes, and having my resources, my parents around all the time, whenever I wasn't feeling right, I could drive home, um, and look what it has done for me now, uh, you know, with my media career, just staying home and being a Pittsburgh person. Yeah, I wrote a letter to myself and said thank you because there's a lot of things that can entice you to do other things and to go different places that might not be the best situation. And I made a really good judgment at a young age, and I'm really proud of myself for doing that and knowing what, you know, how much glitz and glamour is out there and what coaches and people throw at you and everybody wants to have a piece of you and wants to be a part of you. And you're like, hey, I'm just a teenager. Like, uh, I, I, I just want to go to the mall. Like, like, that's all I wanted to do and just hang out. So um, that was probably my proudest I've ever been in my career at, the, at a young age is making a decision and making the right decision um, and not being persuaded in any direction, but making the stern right decision. And uh, what was the second question? Just knowing what you know now, if you could go back and kind of start over that athletic career, what is there anything that you would do differently or change? It's funny you say that. Yes, there is one thing I would change and I would not play football. I would just go into radio because I wouldn't get hit all the time. <laughs> and I could just talk about it for a living and get paid for for it. I can't, I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing. Like the job that I do every day and, you know, you just talk about sports and you get paid for what, why would I need to go get hit running down on kickoffs, getting hit by Ray Lewis? That's not fun. <laughs> that wasn't fun. So uh, all, all, all joking aside, no, I, you know, I would, 
I probably wouldn't change it. I probably wouldn't change anything. And, you know, even the tough times. I didn't play for my first three years at Pitt. You know, I was called a bust. I was going to transfer, and I, I stuck it out. I had that blind faith, and, and I worked every single day. So that never went away. Um, but I could have taken the easy way out. And if you follow sports now and college athletics now, they're, the transfer portal, guys and, and women are leaving and they're doing this NIL, they're getting paid all this money and there's so many different directions you can go and I really, uh, really applied to myself for sticking it through and figuring myself out, kind of what I was saying earlier, you figure out a lot about yourself whenever you face adversity and I was at a tough time, I mean it was very, very tough at a young age, at 19 years old having to deal with that and sticking it out um, I saw the light at the end of the tunnel, that blind faith, and I kept inching closer, inching closer, and it kept getting brighter and brighter, and all of a sudden I knew I was out of the tunnel, and I'm like, wow, look at, look at, what, look at what I can do. There's nothing from that moment on, when I was 19, 20 years old, to this day, there's nothing I don't think I could accomplish because of that moment, because of what I learned of how I stuck through that adversity. There's nothing, if, if I have a task, it may be impossible, but it's not impossible in my mind if I do the things necessary. And that taught me that, and that's really the foundation of who I am right now, is learning about myself at a young age and making those great decisions and sticking to me and believing in myself, believing in my abilities, believing in who I am. So, um, you know, I just... <laughs> I, I, sometimes I can't even believe that I even made those decisions. Like, I'm like, that's a whole other person. And I, don't, I remember making the decisions, but I don't remember being in the moment as much anymore because so many things have happened since then. But I'm just like, wow, like I just, I really had the right people around me uh, at the time to guide me in the right direction. I was just going to ask, what role did those parents, those guardians in your life, those mentors play at that time and that that is a whole um you know discussion about parenting as well and about coaching as well and you know how i approach my kids is somewhat how my parents approached me and I'm, i altered it a little bit is that your kids are going to create their own path you know your path you've already made your path you've already walked down it and you know what it takes to go down and you know there's branches there's rocks you may fall you may get up you may scrape your knee you may you know do this do that but you're still walking down that path with my kids they can do whatever they want and they could create their own path and they're going to but i'll always be behind them to nudge them whenever they veer off the path like that's kind of how my coaches, that's how Bob Palco treated me. That's how my dad treated me. That's how my mom treated me. It was like, hey, you're going to figure out what you need to do necessary. And we're going to let you do that. But if you veer off a little bit, you start stumbling, we're going to pick you up and we're going to put you back on the path. We're not going to hold your hand and drag you along. We're going to let you keep walking, but we're not going to let you veer off a little bit. And that's you know, something that's very little, but very important is that every kid has their own mindset and what they want to do. It's our job as parents and as guardians and as teachers and as coaches to make sure the kids don't veer off the path too far. Now, sometimes it's good to veer off the path because then you have to figure a lot out about yourself, but make sure that they get back on the path at one point. Thank you. you have some question? Keep firing away. I love these. So I think one thing that we've also struggled with is um, getting caught in the comparison trap, whether it's her comparing herself to others or us comparing how we parent in the sense of being an athlete to other parents. And I loved what you started with because we've learned through making some mistakes probably that the balance is really important. So I just wondered if you had any suggestions for how to keep that balance even though maybe others around you aren't. Well, yeah, you're always going to compare to everybody. I mean, that's just human nature, right? I mean, you see somebody that's, you know, lives in a $5 million house and you're like, man, you know, they're, they're lucky. I wish, you know, I could live in a $5 million house. What do they do? Maybe I should do that. But it's about you and who you are at a core and taking all the qualities that you learn from other people. Now, that's kind of how I approach football. Like, you know, people are like, well, who do you emulate? Who do you, you know, see yourself as? Which people were compare trying to compare me to somebody. I'm like, I see myself as me, but I'll take a little bit from Kenny Pickett. I'll take, a, you know, what he does, uh, you know, in the huddle. I'm like, oh, man, I could use that. Or, you know, what uh, LeBron James does whenever he, you know, it, it goes out for a basketball. Oh, I could take that. I could take that and incorporate it into my 
body and into who I am as, a, as an athlete. And we're always going to compare. I mean, that's just human nature. But you, once you compare, you still have to realize who you are, too. You still have to understand that you are where you are for a reason, and you are an athlete for a reason, not because of who people are comparing you to, who you're comparing yourself to. No, you're you. You could take things from everybody, but you're still you at the end of the day, and that you should never lose that uh, mentality of you being you and you knowing what you need to do to get to where you need to be. So I know one of your jobs is to analyze the careers of young men and women, young athletes. So you probably see a lot of decisions being made from either, whether the teams or the organizations, but also the athletes themselves. Have you ever in your shoes now as, a, as that analyst um, thought, boy, I would do something differently? Do you have an example where you're looking at this young athlete making a decision and thinking, oh, I would have really done this a different way? Well. Uh, actually, I was just in a situation like that. I was at the end of Pitt football season, and Jake Cradle, he's a hometown kid, and he plays offensive line at Pitt. And now they have that six-year eligibility from COVID. So I saw him you know, at a restaurant right after the season. He was debating on whether he should stay for another year and enhance his draft stock, or should he enter the draft? And he was talking to me about that, and I was kind of listening. And you know, I had a teammate who uh, played offensive line, but played guard, and then played center too. And he, it was important for him to play both positions because his value went up. And I told him, I was like, you need to, you need to evaluate yourself and say, what can I bring to the table now? or what can I bring to the table next year? And, you know, just that situation right there, he kind of looked at me and was like, yeah, well, you know, I, I want to play in the NFL. I want to do this and that. Like, kind of like the glitz and glamour talk, but actually knowing what the situation is sometimes isn't the decision you want to make, but it is the right decision. And, you know, I left there after talking to him and giving him a few examples and basically telling him, you should come back another year because that'll be very beneficial. And... You know, two days later, he's like, he announced he was coming, going back to Pitt. And I was like, that is the right decision. You know, that is the right decision. You know, he took that. He talked to his family about it. I told him, I was like, talk to your family about it. Get every piece of advice that you can. And then, you know, this is, it's funny how all this is wrapping into one. And then figure out what you think that you can do. And he did that. And he ended up coming back to Pitt. And he's going to be playing this year. And I guarantee he probably wouldn't have got drafted this year, but he will get drafted next year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those decisions like that, um, you know, I, I see all the time and I'm just like, ah, man, should he be doing that or should she be doing that? Should I talk to them or should I let them be them? Um, and then sometimes, you know, young, young kids are like sponges and they could feel it. They could feel something. And then usually they just come up to me and ask. And even though I was going to probably approach them, but they just automatically do it to ask for guidance. So that was a situation recently that I dealt with. We have several high school athletes that have scouts coming to campus or going to games where they're watching them, um, similar to probably your experience where you have the, those scouts, those um, recruiters, you know, coming and visiting with people in their lives. Um, you know, also, I think this goes along with the social, we talked about social media a little bit. So, you know, what advice can you give our high school athletes, you know, now in 2023, what's important? Is it important to have the social media presence? Is it, is it important to have those highlights out there? What, what do you, what do you feel is important for, to have that outward facing picture? What, what does that incorporate? It's, it's important to build your brand nowadays. It really is. It is important to push your name and push what you're doing, but whatever you're pushing and whatever you're putting out there, whether it's film, whether it's, you know, going to a camp, you better be doing good. You know, like, you because if you're bad, then you're not going to get the scouts. Like, they're going to be like, all right, well, this kid, you know, is just trying to push his agenda, trying to push his brand, but there is no brand there. So if you're making those decisions, and it is important to push yourself out there to kind of market yourself. And that that is the good part about, you know, this day and age is, like, you can market yourself. There's so many avenues and outlets that you can market yourself and become successful and to gravitate attention. But once you gravitate that attention, you better have a product that they want. 
So you better be smart about what you put out there and, you know, the messages you send, the pictures you post, um, the videos you post, things of that nature, because everybody is watching. Everybody is watching. And if you're a good player, they will find you. They, they definitely will find you. Besides your family, who was your biggest mentor in your career? Uh, my, high, my high school head coach, Bob Palco. I thought that's who you were going to say. Bob Palco. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he was like my second dad. Um, and it never was about football with him, and even to this day. And it was about, kind of like I said in the beginning, doing things the right way, treating people the right way, um, having the right morals. And, you know, nobody's perfect, but you can strive to be perfect. Um, you know, talking to me and making sure he coached me the right way and making sure my mental side was stronger than my physical side. And, you know, he, I mean, and it's not just me. It's, it's a thousand kids that he has done that to. And, you know, you know, Coach Rossi does that as well with his kids. And that's why you win. I mean, the proof is in the pudding. And that's why, you know, these coaches that we see around here and these coaches that are in this high school and on the high school over the hill are successful is because they care. You know, they, they don't care about you as an athlete. They care about you as a person. They care about you uh, uh, going to class every day, uh, you know, showing up at the right time, showing up early. Uh, those little things uh, Bob Pelka taught to me at a young age. And like I said, it was never about, he never was like, hey, you know, you got to run this way and whenever you're playing. It never was that conversation. We would sit down and he'd be like, did you, you know, what time did you get to class? Well, I got, well, the class starts at 11.02. What time did you get to class? Oh, I got to class at 11.02. You got to get to class at 11. He said, if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. Like little things like that have just, and I'm 35 years old now, and I think about that every day. So the impact that he has had on my life outside of my family, I can't even really describe. I'd be up here for hours just talking about the little things that he taught me that I still use to this day that I will pass along to my kids. And you know, that is important to have those people in your life and to have coaches and, and teachers that really care about you. And you, and you have that here at this, in the school district. And I've been playing against South Fayette ever since I've started playing sports with the uh, same year as, I don't know if you guys remember, Andrew DiDonato and Martin Yader, those guys, and coming over here and playing at Morgan Field. My kids have a game at Morgan Field right now, and I remember coming over here and doing that. And, you know, this school district figured it out a long time ago, and they do actually care about the kids, and that is so, so important. It's so important. I even tell myself, too, like, man, if I would have went to a different school, uh, you know, uh, would I have been the player that I was? I don't think so. If I didn't have Bob Pelka, I don't think I would have been the player that I was. Uh, you know, and in, in, in not in going to, I mean, I'm not going to call a school out, but just a different school. I don't know if I would have been the player I was if I didn't have that support from my school district, from my teachers, from Bob Pelka. So uh, everybody was so vital uh, in my career outside my family that was in my community. What's, what dispositions or characteristics, aside from raw athletic skills, what other like dispositions, characteristics do you feel is the most important to get to that professional level, that next level? Detail and structure and discipline. Uh, you have to be disciplined. You have to follow rules. You have to, um, you know, you have to approach every situation like it's the last time you're going to do it. And like I said, even down to the minute, like, I don't even know how I was wired that way, but I was wired that way, obviously, for a reason. Like, you know, you just lacing up my cleats at the same time, uh, you know, you know, putting on my wristbands at a certain time, stretching at a certain time. You know, that discipline and that regiment that I created when I was younger, you know, pushed me to college football, pushed me into the NFL. You have to be disciplined and not just in sports. Like, it's, it's a life thing. It's every single day. It's, you know, how you treat your brothers and sisters. It's how you treat your parents. It's, you know, hey, you know, so-and-so is having a party. It's like, all right, well, you'd better be home at 10, 10 p.m. and being home at 9.55. Like, it's those little things that 
will trickle into you being an athlete. And that regimen is so big. And, you know, just having that every single day was just amazing. And our college uh, program had Dave Wanstead. He came from the NFL. He had the structure every single day of my college career for four years of an NFL program. And once I got to the NFL, I was like, Oh, well, I, I know where I need to be at this time. I know what this drill is. I know what to do here. I know what to do there because he set it up that way. So whenever we did have the opportunity to go in the NFL, it was an easy transition. So the discipline, the structure, and the mindset to really just want to be great. And, you know, I tell people the story. When I was in high school, I would wait. And we had AIM back then. It's, it's old. It was like a messenger thing uh, back then. And I would wait at, like, 12.30 a.m. where people would put up their away messages and I knew everybody was asleep and or everybody was out at a party or something and I would steal my parents' car and I would drive to the high school. I would be 16 years old and run, run laps, run bleachers, do ladders, do another workout because I knew everybody was sleeping and I knew I was going to get an edge. I knew that. And, and that's really what propelled me. I knew that everybody was either partying or doing something they shouldn't be doing or they were sleeping. So I knew that I was the only one doing what I was doing to get an edge. And I, like I said, I don't even know how I was wired that way, but I was. And thank goodness I was because uh, I, don't, I don't know if I would have made it as far if I wasn't wired that way. Thank you. Dorn, I, I know you've played sports throughout your whole life, and, and your parents, you've watched them, uh, how they've talked to you, know, you and coaches and things like that. Just, and I'm sure if you haven't yet, you'll, you will coach. You know. Can you just give the parents some advice on how to handle a situation if, if there's a situation with a coach? You're going to have many coaches, and you've had many coaches. You're not always going to agree with what the coaches do. But... Can you give the parents advice for them and their kids? What's the best way to approach that situation? Hey, just, you know, listen to your, I mean, your parents are your parents and you're a parent for a reason. And the coach, you know, volunteers to be a coach because they have a philosophy and a method that they think is a winning one. And, um, you know, once, you know, you start stepping in, then you're a, you're a detriment to your kid and that pushes them back so you know if you're a kid if you're a parent you know you have to have the full trust in what the coaches are preaching and what they're doing and sometimes your kid isn't doing well and you know that happens I mean that's a part of sports sometimes they you know didn't beat out the person in front of them that happens and you know that it's not because I'll put it this way coaches want to win right I mean, coaches want to win, and they will do what is necessary to win. And if they felt that your kid was good enough to start, they felt your kid enough, was good enough to play quarterback, point guard, uh, pitcher, then you would play because they want to win. I mean, and, and maybe they're not ready yet. Maybe they need to work a little bit more. Maybe they need that time to kind of settle in to figure out who they are. But one thing I do know is that whenever you are – seeing yourself on the other side of what a coach sees maybe about your kid is at the end of the day, nobody is out there to lose. Nobody is out there to, to just waste time. They want to win. So most of the time, most of the time, not all the time, they are probably putting your kids in the position that they probably need to be in until that they are ready to, to be in a higher position. I guess to follow up on that, we struggle with like, how do you build that drive then in? You know, like, so you have this conversation with your kid after a game, like, yeah, you didn't get in. How oh, I wish I could have played. So what are you going to do? Like, you're talking about like going to run at midnight, <laughs> those kind of things. I have a ninth grader and eighth grader. You know, they're teenagers. They're at that age where you struggle with how much do you push or how much do you want them to intrinsically want to get better? So like, how do you balance that? Like as a parent, like how much do you push them? Like, hey, you need to do this if you want to get better. Look, if you're not happy with our plan, this is what you got to do. Or do you let them figure that kind of thing out? Like, 
I know what I got to do. Like, I think that's where I kind of struggle with. Yeah, you kind of let them figure that out, but it's about competing. And, you know, my dad taught me that at a young age. Like, I would see my dad in the basement, you know, doing 100 cup, cuts a night of jump rope. And I'd just, like, be watching. And then he would look at me, and he'd hand me a jump rope. He'd be like, you think you could do it? And I'm like, yeah, if you could do it, I can do it. You know, just not, not you know, pushing me to do something, but kind of manipulating me, being like, hey, I'm going to compete too. Or in a video game, you know, well, I want to win. You know, you can breed that healthy competition between your teenagers and kind of just roll the ball out there. You want to compete every single day. I mean, I compete with my kids. My kids, like I said, eight years old, and I will not let them score a basket on me. Like, I'm 35, 35 years old, and, they, you know, they were like, oh, let's play one-on-one. -on -one. I'm like, you're not – you're not going to score. <laughs> yeah. I'm just so competitive, but that's teaching them how to be competitive as well because nothing is easy. Whenever you're an athlete, nothing's easy in life. And, you know, the little lessons like that, I think, can go far without pushing them to do something, without pushing them to, you know, make it feel like it's a job. It shouldn't feel like it's a job. It should be fun. It should be sports. Hey, Dorn. Let's throw you a little curveball. Um, so it looks like you've played, you know, major college, NFL. And uh, some of us have some athletes in high school that think that maybe some of the college athletics and pro could be somehow scripted. Uh, just kind of throwing you a curveball. Just something that you kind of have to say from what you hear from some of your coaches. You're talking about coaches want to win. And, you know, you've got betting and you've got, you know, athletes who may throw things or have, you know, Twitter accounts, all this kind of stuff that happens. That some of these kids thinking that uh, maybe there's things that are being uh, scripted a little bit, like they should win or they should lose and they dropped it on purpose. They're, you know, thrown to a certain guy on purpose. You see any? Do you have any feeling on any of that? I, no, I wouldn't say it was scripted of of like the game at all, but maybe like scripted into, um, you know, some pushing somebody that maybe isn't, you know, at the college level at least, college and pro. Well, the pro level is all business, so you know, scripted to the fact like, all right, I may be a better tight end than uh, you know Scott Chandler, but Scott Chandler is making four million dollars, and I'm making you know, $500,000. They're going to get their investment back and they're going to play Scott Chandler over me even though that I'm 100 times better because they invested $4 million. So, like, scripted in that nature. And in college, it's, you know, politics. I mean, you have a, a hometown guy in Tyler Palco who's a quarterback, and then you have a backup who's competing with him in Joe Flacco. And this is a real situation. And I don't think it was scripted for Tyler to – and Tyler was an unbelievable athlete. He was, uh, uh, you know, the, the most competitive person I've ever been around. But it probably would have been better suited to have Tyler Palco as the quarterback of the University of Pittsburgh that just came out of West Allegheny and was a three-time All-State player and was an All-American than probably Joe Flacco. And obviously, at the end of the day, Joe Flacco transfers and wins at the Super Bowl. So um, I wouldn't say scripted as the game, but maybe scripted into pushing individuals in a certain spot, not in high school, but more in college and pro because of just the nature of it and the structure of it, especially pro. Like I said, with the money involved, uh, it's a business at the end of the day, and you want to get your return of your investment, and you're going to get the most out of uh, you know, whoever that is. Uh, as much money that you invested in them, you're going to try to get the most back from that investment. Well, if you don't mind, uh, just trying to give them a little information about the NIL. It's a it's a big deal now, and it's 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 uh, you know it's coming into high school now too. And just any knowledge you have, any I mean, it's not all pros. There's I mean, there's cons to it as well. If you just give them any knowledge you have about the NIL, especially you know now that it's coming into the high school ranks as well. Well, NIL. I mean, that's a whole another monster there, and I hate NIL because I would have made a lot of money back in the high school if they had it. So I hate it because I'm a little salty about it. But um, uh, 
and I the the biggest the biggest thing about NIL and especially high school athletes and college athletes is to make sure that you have representation. Uh, you can't handle that all by yourself. Now you think you can. You think you can negotiate money, and you know, I mean, there's you know the, the women's basketball player Angel Reese. I mean, she was making I think like 50k before that uh, national championship game, and now she's making two point some million. You can't you can't manage that yourself. You need to find a lawyer. You need to find an advisor, and you need to find a, a, a tax person. You need to find a, a CPA because. You know, at the end of the day, you don't know those things that you need to take taxes out of the checks that you're getting. You don't know um, how to read the language of a contract. I mean, these businesses are offering a lot of money, but you know they've been in business a long time, and these businesses are successful businesses, and they're successful for a reason. So you hand a young person a contract, and they're like, "Wow, you know, you see all the zeros on there. That's all you see." But you don't read the language in it, saying like, "Hey, you know, if you don't hit, you know." 53 pointers, then you don't get paid at all, or you have to pay something back. So I think it'd be important for young people to have advisement, to have lawyers, um, attorneys, and to have a CPA to kind of guide them through those things. I mean, it's even hard whenever you become a young adult, you know, whenever you're in your late 20s to try to manage that stuff. So, I mean, these businesses are giving out contracts that have certain languages written up that they've done a thousand times to adults, and adults probably can mess up contracts. And what do you think a kid's going to do if they're managing them, managing that, if they're managing that themselves? So, um, I think that that's very important to hire uh, a high-level attorney to oversee some of the things that uh, you're doing if you are having the opportunities for NIO. Well, if anyone else has any questions, we might wrap it up. We want to thank you so much, Doran, for your time tonight, being here with us and being part of our speaker series this year. Uh, we really appreciate the advice you have for us and our community. So thank you so much for your time tonight. I would a round of applause for Mr. Dickerson. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys for coming out and, you know, and, and, and listening to this. I hope it was helpful. And honestly, you know, I, I live in the district. My kids go to South Fayette. And if you see me around or if you want to follow me on social media, um, I'm willing to answer any questions that you want. I'm very accessible. I'm always around. I'm always willing to help. And, you know, even send your kids my way. And if they have questions, I'll, I'll answer any question. And, and I, but I will be honest. So if they're not looking for honesty, if they're looking to get a pat on the bat, back, you know, that, that ain't me. I'm going to tell them honest, and uh, I'm going to make sure that they're uh, heading in the right direction. But I'm very accessible, so if you want to find me anywhere, if you see me, just stop me, and you know we can, uh, we can talk. So, But I thank you guys. Appreciate it a lot. I really do. Thank you.